All right. Last week, we finished all but the last two questions of lesson two on our, um, uh, for our, our book. So we're on question seven. Explain the sense in which Paul in Ephesians 2.20 says the apostles are part of the foundation of the church. Okay. Yeah, verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Okay. Yeah, and I think, I think that's exactly right. The fact that the apostles' teaching came directly from Jesus. And it's very important to acknowledge the fact that the apostles didn't make things up. They didn't get to determine what was right and wrong. They taught, as both Jesus had taught them, Matthew 28, and whatsoever things I've commanded you, you to teach them to observe those things. But then also the fact that, that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. And that the Holy Spirit would speak the things from the Lord. And so the apostles and you know, a lot of those, some of the especially details, because remember Jesus died before the church was established. He had to, and he had to be raised and ascended in heaven before the church to be established. But then all the details and stuff about the, about the church and about worship and things like that come from the example of the New Testament church via the commandment of the apostles. And so that's part of why Paul says this is, this is the foundation. He mentions the prophets there. Why? What did the prophets have to do with it? All right. Remember, uh, last quarter we talked about the Messianic prophecies and how much there is in the Old Testament regarding what the Messiah was going to accomplish and what God was going to accomplish in this new covenant that he was going to set forward or set forth. And so there in verse 20, the fact that this household of God is the context of verse 19, the household of God has been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, certainly the Messianic prophecies, and to a certain extent could could the, the current of the time, the current day apostles, and then those on whom had been laid hands to receive gifts of prophecy, they could also be under consideration as well. But it's the revelation of God's will. That revelation was contained in the Messianic prophecies all the way up through inclu and including uh, the connection to John the Baptist and how that he would prepare the way for the Messiah. And then, of course, then through the apostles and those who had the miraculous gifts of the New Testament time, uh, all based upon what Christ said. And that's the key component there. And that goes back to that authority in religion. And that didn't, that ap what's referenced as the apostolic authority doesn't get passed on. Did the apostles have the authority to kind of, <laughs> all right, I'm choosing you now to take my place as an apostle? No. In fact, even in Acts 1, when they filled Judas's place, who was it that chose? God did. Yeah, they cast lots. They didn't have any control over that. Ultimately, there were two men. There were certain guidelines that, the, uh, that had to kind of be, be part of that, had to be with us from the beginning and so forth. Two individuals were, were uh, chosen or they, uh, they were selected, and, and God chose between those two. And, of course, Matthias was the one who ended up taking Judas's place. But the only reason why Judas's position was filled in the per first place was why? Why did Peter say this had to be done? It was according to scripture. It was according to prophecy. Okay. It was not setting a precedent that any time a new apostle died or another apostle died or something happened, that that apostle's position had to be filled. Okay. Do we see in Acts 12 and verses 1 through 3 and 4 when James the apostle is killed by Herod, do we see a new apostle being put in place? Nope. No, and, a lot, and there are people who will argue, well, we have to assume that there was. Do we ha is that a necessary inference? That there's nowhere ever referenced another apostle after some new apostle that we haven't heard about before. Nowhere else is that referenced. If that were the case, maybe we could necessarily infer that. But that's not the case. Which leads us directly to question eight. List some of the other examples of necessary inference in scripture. So what now? Okay. All right. And expedi yeah, expedients are a necessary inference. Okay. And, and with regard to an expedient, keep in mind the definition of expedient is anything that neither adds to nor takes away, but simply assists in the fulfilling of a commandment by God. Psalm books are one example of an expedient. And it means, could we still sing without psalm books? <laughs> 
Sure, absolutely we could. We, I mean, we would kind of be relegated to songs we all know, but sure, we could do that. You know, anything that the removal of it doesn't change the action, doesn't change the fulfillment of the command, then it's an expedient. And so it's helpful in that process. So certainly expedients kind of at large are one of those inferences. And implied authority is an aspect to that. Acts 8, starting with verse 38, when Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch sometimes, and I've heard the argument personally, that, that when they went down into the water, rather than being immersed, what do some people say that Philip did to the eunuch? grab some water and poured it on it. But where were they? In the water. Why did they have to do, why did they have to go down in the water just to grab some and pour it on his head or sprinkle it on him? And, this is, and of course the term itself, keep in mind the term baptism means immersion. Okay, Taking that out of the equation, just the context itself, necessary inference implies they went into the water for the purpose of immersing. Uh, Acts chapter 8 and in verse 12, um, and even with the Ethiopian eunuch, verse 35 and 36, we know that Philip taught the city of Samaria regarding the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. And when they believed, verse 12, both men and women were what? They were baptized. Yet, does it say anywhere that Philip taught about baptism? Does it say anywhere with the Ethiopian eunuch Philip taught about baptism? But what must we necessarily infer, given that that's exactly what both did? He taught baptism. That was part of that teaching regarding the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Okay, Jesus says, go. Go into all the world. What's a necessary inference there? Okay, mode of travel. Does Jesus care how you get there? He doesn't care. He doesn't care how you get there. Okay, you go. By whatever means you have at your disposal, you go. And again, that implied authority and necessary inference kind of go hand in hand with that example as well. But you go into all the world, therefore the necessary inference is however I can get there is part of that authority given to us in Scripture. Okay. Anything through that? All right, let's move. Necessary inference, though, is there's one conclusion. It's not multiple. Doors. Right. That's where a lot of people mess up. Right. There's, and, and that's part of the reason why we emphasize that phrase, necessary inference. People can infer a lot of things from a lot of different things that aren't necessarily there, aren't they? Or can't they? People do that a lot. And that's why we emphasize that phrase, necessary inference. In other words, to infer it any other way contradicts Scripture. Okay, that, that's basically what the opposite of the necessary inference is. You we must necessarily infer this because to infer otherwise or in any other way means that it's going to contradict something somewhere. And we believe in the harmony of the scriptures. We believe that, yes, man wrote, or they penned the, the, the Bible, but God authored it. And therefore, we believe that it is going to harmonize together because nothing God says is going to contradict itself. That's part of that necessary inference. All right. Talked to me one time. He was talking about he thinks backwards through the scriptures. Say what? He thinks backwards through it, and he starts inferring, and it's like going backwards, like going through a funnel backwards. Oh wow! And he just started leading out and just oh, go from a specific to a much, yeah. much broader. Yeah. yeah. And so, therefore, we have to do this. <laughs> it's like you've created a whole new, you know, a whole new, no, whole new way that we don't find in scripture of taking God's word and utilizing it in whatever way you want to, basically. Yeah. All right. Okay, moving on to lesson three, original sin. Um, so as we noted, uh, well, no, we didn't note last week. Uh, Genesis chapter three, uh, starting in verse one. Uh, what, what do we have the account of in Genesis three, verses one through seven? Okay, of Adam, Adam and Eve in the garden, the serpent comes and there's temptation that Eve basically falls to because of this, this fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Are we ever told it was an apple? No, we're never told it was an apple. It just says it's the fruit of the knowledge or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I would, I would argue in fact that it would have probably been something that was first of all, extremely obvious and that we do not have today. <laughs> That's, that would be my suggestion because I don't think that that it, the fruit itself didn't really matter. That's not really what the point was, but I would suggest that it's not something we have today. This was something unique and it was in the midst of the garden. I assume it was one tree, not a whole orchard or a grouping, just one single tree, just like the tree of life was one single tree. 
Uh, and so this would have been unique uh, to, to, the, to the garden to this point in time. So we have the account given to us in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, we have the law that was given to Adam and Eve. Okay, Even Adam and Eve, even in their childlike state, they still had a single law. And that was that of all of the, the fruit of the garden, they could eat except for this one tree. And we see how that they were told that. Then because they ate of the tree, they therefore were cast out. Adam was given a consequence because he ate. Eve was given a consequence because she was deceived. And the serpent was given a consequence because he tempted Eve and thus Adam. Uh, so Adam therefore is brought up in the New Testament, and so is Eve, by the way, but, or at least in reference. The idea of Adam, though, comes up especially in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. And the, part of the point that Paul brings out here is, especially as it pertains to, notice Romans chapter 5, but particularly verse... Uh, Verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. And thus, verse 12 then makes, that's part of the reason why Paul includes this. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, thus men, death spread to all men. The contrast is Jesus. So through Adam, all men die. Because in addition to the idea of spiritual death, because sin then entered the world, or at least the knowledge of sin entered the world is more specific there. And of course, through Adam's falling, sin entered into man's consciousness. Through Christ, that sin, sin is taken away. Okay. And so the idea there is that, that contrast being put into place. Uh, the point that, um, uh, that Kyle brings out here, especially when he says, Paul declares plainly that death spread to all because all sinned. Adam set the example. Adam made sin possible just as Jesus made salvation possible. And in Paul's illustration, Adam's sin did not automatically condemn all any more than Jesus' righteous act automatically saved all. Both involved choice. I think that's a very important point, and it would be very hard to argue from the perspective of one, especially who has Calvinist tendencies, who believe in the... Uh, uh, there's variations of original sin. Okay, there, There's variations of... The idea of the, the specific sin of Adam versus sinful nature and all that. There's different variations of original sin. But the idea of this, this uh, total uh, depravity of man, which is the T in the tulip doctrine, total depravity. It, it's, it's, there's a lot of religions, a lot of religious ideas that, that kind of carry that concept within their, their thought process. And it would be very hard to argue that all people, therefore, are saved, but... Or the opposite, that, that because uh, all people are lost, therefore that means through Jesus all people are saved. In fact, one of the key components of, of Calvinism actually goes back to, uh, in some ways, uh, pre, uh, predestination in a lot of ways. Uh, so I thought that was a really good contrast to show this difference between just because Adam's sin didn't automatically mean everyone therefore born is automatically in sin, inheriting sin from Adam. Neither are all people saved just because Jesus died. Thoughts or comments to that first point? Adam is brought up again in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, what's the context of 1 Corinthians 15? I mean, the whole chapter. Resurrection. Resurrection. Okay, and people in Corinth are listening to individuals teaching them that the dead, there is no resurrection of the dead. Paul makes the case that if there is no resurrection of the dead, that means Christ isn't risen. Now, whether or not this teaching was in any way related to Hymenaeus and Philetus, remember, they were teaching that the resurrection was already past. Now, whether they were claiming that that resurrection was Jesus' resurrection or that the resurrection that the Bible tells us about is, is our resurrection out of baptism. I don't know what Hymenaeus and Philetus specifically, how they were applying that. But regardless, we do know what the end result is, is that they, were, they thought, they believed that there would be no physical resurrection one day. Well, the whole point, therefore, then, is that if there is no physical resurrection one day, and we die before Jesus comes back, then what's our result? We're out of luck, aren't we? We're out of luck. 
That, well, and that's, that's Paul's point, is that Jesus can't come back. If Jesus wasn't raised, then there, or if there is no resurrection, then Jesus isn't raised. And the fact that Paul makes that argument, because in my thought process, you know, if I'm, if, if I'm of this inclination thinking that there is no resurrection of the dead, I could say to myself, well, I can believe that Jesus was raised and yet not, be, not have a resurrection of the dead one day. Yet Paul says that they're one and the same. You cannot believe that if Jesus Christ was raised, there won't be a resurrection. Because it's, it's, in, it's combined within the promise of God. Therefore, if Christ is raised, that means God is going to fulfill the promise to raise us as well. You can't extricate the two from one another. They both go hand in hand. Well, Paul uses Adam in this example, in verse, starting in verse 20 on through verse 26. In this particular example, now Romans 5 focused on the concept of sin. Okay, so in particular sin and the idea of death and sin. But here, 1 Corinthians 15, it's specific to death. Uh, and, in the, and, and especially in the physical sense. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and in verse 22, I think it is. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each after his own order. First Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ that is coming. Notice we're talking about not spiritual life and death here. We're talking about physical life and death. Notice Christ the first fruits, but all shall be made alive. Well, those who are faithful in Christ, are they spiritually alive? They, they are right now. But Paul's not referencing spiritual life and death, not the, the, the forgiveness of sins. He's referencing the resurrection of the dead, the physical resurrection. And so that's why this point in 1 Corinthians 15 is so important because Romans 5 focuses on that spiritual death that through Adam, sin entered into the world. In 1 Corinthians 15, Adam is the example of physical death as well. Both of those elements are being used to describe Adam and through Adam and Eve both. But through him came physical and spiritual death. But then through Jesus came physical and spiritual what? Life. Thoughts or comments through that? Okay, so he moves from this to describe the idea of inherited sin, or it's sometimes referred to as original sin, um, the first sin. Sometimes, in fact, I think there's a, it's a Catholic, it's not a catechism, it's a, some kind of a kind of Catholic commentary, and it's titled The First Sin. And it utilizes this concept of original sin or inherited sin is the idea. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 24 and in verse 16, what does the law tell? What does God tell Moses or tell the people through Moses? If you put to death for your own sin. You are going to be judged for your own wickedness. The sin of the father. Now, this is not to say that the consequence doesn't carry on. Sometimes did the children of a, of a, of a person, did they suffer consequences for the sin of the father? Sure. But the sin itself, the guilt of the sin itself is not to be applied to the next generation and the generation after that. And the irony here is, is that in the New Testament, we know for a fact that some of the Jews believed that if somebody was born blind, what did that mean? They had to be born in sin. That's the only explanation that if there was some physical deformity or physical issue when somebody is born, it's because you have inherited the sin of some family member or parent. And yet, what does Jesus say about that? Neither this man nor he. Neither this man nor, nor, yeah, it had nothing to do with sin. It had everything to do with God showing his power over physical, over physical deformity. And it's interesting that even when this man was then taken and interviewed by the Sanhedrin, and this man, he says, it's, it's never, ever been known since the beginning of the world that, that a man born and blind could ever have his sight uh, given back to him or given to him. And they make the case, you know, well, it, <laughs> in fact, even before that, they said, you know, we know this man's a sinner, but praise God, somehow this miracle happened. Remember that, which is, is comical almost in itself, the idea that God accidentally did a miracle through this sinful person. <laughs> this man, we know this man's a sinner, all right, but, but somehow this miracle happened. But then the reference to the fact that, you know, we know you were born in sin, so how dare you preach to us after this man basically said, are you going to follow him too? 
you know, uh, how dare you preach to us? We know you were born in sin, so how dare you? And, and so the idea was something that was, it was instilled in a lot of people's minds. And yet, in the old law itself, which they should have known, is that there is no carry on or continuing of, of that guilt of sin. Now, I think the Jews would probably argue that in some ways, they might would argue that difference of guilt and consequence. Well, your parents were guilty of some sin, therefore God punished you for it. But that's, that's not how that works. That's punishment is because of guilt. Consequence is different. Punishment is because of guilt. No one is punished for something that they haven't done by God. No one receives punishment because of guilt of sin that they haven't committed. Now, and this is reemphasized in 2 Kings 14. It's emphasized in 2 Chronicles 25. But then you have the example of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, this is another example. And, and Ezekiel deals a lot with this aspect of inherited sin or the idea of, of whether or not sin passes on. And he mentions this proverb, God does. And he says this proverb, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. And so then he says in verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. It's interesting that when you read that proverb that the people are using, it makes it sound, I mean, we, we, and based on the context, we know that they're using this proverb to suggest that the children are suffering guilt. They're suffering sin because of their, their parents' sin. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, therefore that gets passed on to the children. The children's teeth are set on edge because of the sour grapes. As if the children are suffering, they're being punished because they've inherited the sin from a parent. And God says, you will no longer use that proverb. You will no longer say that. Because as I live, verse 3, and then he says, all souls belong to me. And how does God judge each soul? Does he judge it as part of a group? He judges it as an individual. Okay, whether it's a family unit or otherwise, he judges it as an individual. Thus, each one who sins, they'll receive punishment for their sin. Not some inherited sense of, of punishment for sin. Ezekiel 18 and in verse 20, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father. Again, guilt is that association of, of who's being punished. Again, consequence is different. Okay, for instance, the baby that was, that was born to uh, uh, David and Bathsheba. Did that baby die? Yes. But what did even David recognize in that moment when, after the baby died? Yeah. Okay, he can't come back to me, but I can go to him. So what did David recognize with that baby? It was sinless. David understood that. He recognized that that baby was innocent. It was not bearing the guilt of the sin of David. It bore the consequence of the sin of David. You think about Achan. Do you remember what happened to Achan when they went up against Jericho and they were told explicitly not to take anything from Jericho, that it was all going to be given to God. But Achan took some things, right? He hid them under his tent. Then they go up against the city of Ai and what happened? In fact, by everything I can read, the city of Ai was nothing like Jericho. It was very small, had nothing, nothing compared to Jericho to defend itself with, and they were defeated. And so Joshua, what's going on? What happened? And God, there's sin. And there's an understanding that they, as they go down, they whittle it down. God tells Joshua to whittle it down all the way down. Of course, God knew who it was the whole time, right? They whittled it down to Achan. Achan confessed. But then was it only Achan who was stoned with stones? It was Achan. It was his belongings. It was his livestock. And then who else? His wife and his children. Now, maybe his wife knew about it. That could be. But does it necessarily have to be? Can't she suffer the consequence of Achan's actions just like his children did? There's no reason to sit there and try to say, well, they had to have known. That's the only reason why God would have allowed them to all be stoned. It was Achan's sin 
Okay. The punishment for Achan's sin included not only Achan, but remember what God said? The person who has sinned, all that he has will be destroyed. God didn't suggest that his whole family was involved in this. It's just Achan. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. While she was pregnant, that baby is as innocent as any other baby. But if it's born addicted to drugs, that's a consequence of Absolutely. someone else's sin. Absolutely. The baby had no control over it. Had no control, and so and and bears no guilt no. either as a result no. of that. Right. Now later on in its life, does that mean that that baby is likely going to have specific issues yes. to deal with and to address? Sure, sure it will. But we all have, in some form or fashion, weaknesses we have to face and deal with. All right? But you're absolutely right. The choice was not the baby's. And just like with David and Bathsheba, that baby didn't, had, no, had no bearing whatsoever on what happened between David and Bathsheba. But David recognized, he can't come back to me, but I can go to him. Well, David wasn't looking to go to hell, was he? That's not where he was envisioning joining his, his baby who'd passed away. He's looking forward to being in heaven one day. All right, anything through point or point B, letter B. C, the nature of Christ. So the Bible teaches that Jesus was a descendant of Adam. And I thought that was a really good point because in the two genealogies that we have in Matthew and in Luke, one of the genealogies goes all the way back to Adam. And this is Luke chapter 3. And I thought that was a really good point to bring up because this would mean without a, beyond a doubt, if you're going to talk about not just inherited sin from a, a, since we're all in a sense descended from Adam and thus as well as Noah kind of in the restart but specifically the ancestry of Jesus was traced all the way back to Adam that means that sin had to go down all the way through the line to Jesus but what does the Hebrew writer tell us he was he, had, he was without blemish without spot he had no sin now, the argumentation that some might try to make on that is the fact that, well, yes, Jesus never chose to sin, but he still had sin. And I've heard that distinction made that, well, God's got basically as far as God's concerned, there's two different categories of sins. There's the sin you inherit, then there's the sins that you choose to commit. The ch sins you choose to commit, that's, that's kind of the thing that you have control over, but you still have to deal with this sin. And so God somehow just prevented that from, from kind of coming on Jesus. Does that make any sense? That, that in Jesus' case, in his case, he kept Jesus from inheriting the sin. And I thought that was a really weird argument to try to make without any scriptural concept whatsoever to say that somehow God prevented the sin from Adam from coming upon Jesus' soul or spirit and therefore be guilty of that. But the Hebrew writer clearly says he had no sin. No sin. Whether by choice or otherwise, he had no sin. Therefore. Well, he couldn't have been our, our propitiation, our payment. And that's the whole point. If, you know, if he had had inherited sin. Yes. Right, right. And, and only something that was perfect and without sin could that be done. Okay, and those who hold to the idea of inherited sin, that whole concept of the perfect sacrifice. And again, that's why, and I don't think this is a widespread belief. This is something that I, I read in connection to a commentary on, uh, uh, I think it was on 1 Corinthians 15 with, with uh, uh, no, it was Romans 5 with the inherited, the idea of through, through sin or uh, through death, the sin came through, uh, through everybody. Uh, but part of that idea is that in order to try to address this criticism or this argument, they have to try to somehow kind of circle out Jesus to put him out from the rest of humanity to say somehow Jesus didn't inherit the sin, whereas everybody else did. And how they go about doing that, it didn't detail how they do that. <laughs> um, that's a great point. Yeah, because then it's all on Mary, you know, or, or you know, the, or the idea, the, the immaculate conception, completely pure, completely holy, but still Mary, again, and Luke three, we have these two genealogies for a reason, and they are different. 
Okay, going back to a certain point, the names are different after a certain point. And it is best understood as being Matthew's genealogy is Joseph's. Luke 3 is Mary's, showing that from both sides, even though Joseph, or Jesus may not have had Joseph's DNA, no matter which side you went, legal side, which would be through the father, or the flesh side, which would be through Mary, either way, he still was the child of David, and he still goes all the way back to Adam. Well, okay, uh, I don't know. You're right. God could have just put Joseph's DNA in there if he'd wanted to. I'll, I'll grant that. I'm sure God had the power to do that. Yeah. Okay, uh, point two, he brings out the Bible also teaches Jesus was without sin. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Uh, but that doesn't stop people from talking about the idea of original sin. And so the idea of whether it's inherited sin, original sin, the idea that babies are born in sin, therefore the need to baptize babies. And this is widely known in Catholicism. In fact, in the Reformation, you see a whole lot of pushback. In fact, the idea of baptizing babies was one of the big uh, differentiations between a lot of these religions like, um, uh, that came out of the Reformation, including the idea of, of uh, the, the Methodist nature and so forth, Brownists, which eventually became the Baptists. Uh, but Calvinism still kind of held, there were still some religions even out of the Reformation. In fact, John Calvin, his whole plan was not to do away with the Catholic Church. It's just that there were certain parts of the Catholic Church that needed to be refined. That there were certain things that he felt that, that the Catholic Church was right on, most things, but there were certain things he needed that he needed to address. And inherited sin was not one of them. Calvinism and the Tulip Doctrine does not take out the idea of the baptism of children. It, in fact, John Calvin kind of, if you read some of his, his thoughts on that, he kind of waffles back and forth, kind of rides that line between saying, yes, all babies are going to hell versus not, which is what Catholicism does today as well. If you really put them to the test, they would have to say that they, they do, they have to go to hell. But a lot of times, I don't know if any of you encountered this, any discussions with, a, with anyone who's Catholic, there's a third place now that they think that babies go. Okay, there's heaven and then there's hell. And of course, we know that when we die, we don't go to heaven or hell. We go to the realm of the dead. But there, now there's a third area where these innocent babies, okay, that aren't baptized before they die, where they go. And it's called limbo and there's other different words for it. But basically, it's one of those places where people who believe in Catholicism can put these babies and then they can just say, and then God will decide one day. And without committing one way or the other because if they say they're going to hell they know that's going to get a huge pushback if they say they're going to heaven that contradicts what the catholic the whole concept of inherited sin is so they can't they're kind of in between a rock and a hard place so they create this third zone where, where these babies who die where they go uh, and that's kind of their way out of that but jesus taught that children possess the nature and character of citizens in the kingdom of heaven matthew 19 in fact there's three places where God, or where Jesus rather, refers to children as being of the nature of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, you must be like this little child if you hope to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Two out of the three places, Jesus is specifically referencing their humility, okay, their humble nature, the character that they have. Here in Matthew 19, especially, he's emphasizing the purity, the holiness. You must be like, you must become like this little child. But if a little child, a little child can't inherit the kingdom of heaven, then Jesus lied. That's what it boils down to. Jesus lied. If I, if I, can't, if I, have to, if I become like a little children, child, I'm still going to hell because I have inherited sin. Either that or give us really bad directions. Or bad directions. That's or right. Huh? Or, or yeah, or maybe those children are already baptized. Yeah, yeah, that's... All right, so B, sinful nature. So the idea of expanding upon the idea of original sin, and he's going to bring this up with the first question, is the idea of the sinful nature that man has. And he mentions the fact that there's some expand on this false doctrine, and they teach that Adam's sin gave man a sinful nature. And I want, I want to stress that, that what this is about isn't describing the weakness of the flesh. That's not really what this is about, because that's what question one, and I kind of had to go back and read this twice, because I've never actually heard anybody make this type of argument before. But I, I realized what Kyle was picking up on was the fact that it's not so much that, he, that they're saying that, well, because we're flesh and blood, we have an inherent weakness to things of the flesh, especially sinful, pleasurable things that, that appeal to us and that Satan's going to use to get at us. Is that true? Yeah. We are physical beings, aren't we? 
And, and there are, are elements about the flesh that are, are automatically kind of inherently lend themselves to sinful pleasure, don't they? Okay, that is true. But does that mean that we have a bent or a desire or, or somehow our nature is inherently evil? No. No, it's not inherently evil, yet that's part of what this kind of this, the variation of this idea of inherited sin kind of falls into. Uh, and I thought it was interesting, the New International Version that he brings out reflected a bias towards the false doctrine in his first editions, frequently translating the word meaning flesh as sinful nature. And I actually picked up on that in a couple, some, some of these newer translations as well. Uh, that the NIV, some of its, its, it has since kind of tried to undo some of those translations, but some of the newer ones have put it in. So where it should just be rendered flesh, sinful nature is used. Now the context can still help us understand that we're talking about the weakness of the flesh and in some of the contexts where it's just mentioned flesh, it's the weakness of the flesh that's being emphasized. Not sinful nature in the sense that by my nature I'm sinful. That's not really what the point, that's not, that's not what the term means. Well I was going to say Jacob and Esau are an example I think of the drive of the, the flesh and the physical body. Yeah. So Yeah. And I'm like, okay, pea soup. He sold his, his birthright for some pea soup. That doesn't, you know, not But because of his physical nature, yeah. he kind of, yeah. And, and the Hebrew his writer. His birthright was of no value and the food was more value. Right. And Hebrews chapter 12, the Hebrew writer tells us in no uncertain terms that Esau sought it, sought repentance diligently with tears. But once he sold it, could it be undone? No. no. Like once he kind of came to himself, he realized what he'd done. But the flesh sometimes, and, and with the influence of Satan helping it, it kind of zones us in, straight into what we want, which is the flesh a lot of times, because that's, you know, there's a part of us that's what we want. And so we get zoned in and, and we don't want to think about God. We don't want to think about Jesus on the cross. We don't think, want to think about, you know, what's important for our soul. We want to think about what's important for our flesh. Or what we feel is important for our flesh. And Esau is a good example of that. Yeah. Did I see a hand somewhere? All right. So, in conclusion, he mentions mankind has not inherited the sin of Adam. All souls come into this world free of sin. Each of us has the choice to be right or wrong, in spite of the fact that all souls are accountable at some point to choose to do sin. The example of Jesus shows that man does not have to sin, nor does he possess a sinful nature. Now, there is one scripture that isn't mentioned in this chapter that we're going to bring up here with question one. There's a Psalm of David, Psalm 51, verse 5. I think that's right. Psalm, I think it's Psalm 51. Yeah, Psalm 51, verse 5, where David says that he was born in what? His mother conceived him in what? Sin. Okay? So, or iniquity. So, next week we'll pick up here with question one, and we're going to talk about this question and the idea of Psalm 51, verse 5, and how it relates, because I think it fits really well here with question one. All right. Thank you, everybody.